There are a lot of plants that can produce biodiesel or bioethanol, but the productivity varies an awful lot. And what is more important, what is the total cost? What's the climate cost? What's the social cost? What's the ecological cost? Those need to be taken in account. So in that, I think that, first of all, the sugar palms really stand out in terms of how much energy that they can produce per hectare per year compared to oil palms or to sugarcane, and doing it from a forest, not from a monoculture, from a mixed forest. And uh, there are only 70 producing trees needed per hectare in that mixed forest to achieve 24,000 liters of ethanol per hectare. Now, those studies were done by me. So people say, well, he must be exaggerating this and that. So there were six independent studies done, and all of them said that I was wrong, that the yields should be much higher than what I had given them. And the latest one is actually done by Windrock, a group from the United States, and this was a study because the Dutch government financed the pilot project where we implemented some of my patents for producing this sustainable energy and independently they asked uh, Windrock and Ecofist to do an assessment. So here you have your kind of numbers. I think the battery is running out on this one. So you know more about those graphs. The interesting thing was that after we published this a lot of people started contacting us because it says a special number, 43% rate of return on investment while doubling income for local people and creating sustainability. So this type of forest may actually be interesting to you. Maybe you should look a little bit further, go back to nature and to the condition in the tropics what's going on. We have done this planting already since 1989 and the results of the plus trees that we have planted are amazing. These trees also provide food security and they don't die when there is flooding. So the Iradavati Delta, when they had had sugar palms, they would have had food and sterile drinks in great abundance. They survive fire. So the, uh, they can even provide buffer zones to protect the forest behind it. And by creating so many jobs in uh, the buffer zone, you actually keep people away from doing work in illegal logging, where they're dying with malaria in camps and making a little bit of money, breaking their backs. They prefer actually to stay closer to their homes and have a better income and be able to go home in the evening. Sugar palms are also even volcanic explosion resistant. They have a thick layer of wax on the leaves and they use only half the amount of water of other trees. This is the volcano that's in front of my window in uh, North Sulawesi, where those sugar palms are standing. And one of the great things is also that they live in symbiosis with ants. So if there is anything attacking it, immediately it's the ants that start attacking the insects and protect it. And then they have this covering of very silica-holding material that prevents any beetle from drilling in there. So there's a biological and a physical protection. The roots, they go very deep, and uh, you can plant them still mixed with cocoa and coffee because they need the more superficial soil. So even though the roots are small, they go very deep and they last a long time. They even can grow in brackish water, even can grow on soils with aluminium toxicity meaning that a lot of these lost soils actually may still have a potential. But the great thing is, you can only do it if you plant them in a mixed forest. So here, they were planted in monoculture, and they all become stunted and yellow. But once you plant them underneath the trees, they become part of what we call the mycorrhizal guild, all these microorganisms, fungi, then they grow well. So the closer to the trees, the better they grow. If they are far away from the trees, they don't grow. So this is wonderful. We can actually have a use for biodiverse forests that will produce more. And you can grow a mixed age forest that at any time will have young and adult trees in the same ratio and that will produce year round. So this is an eight year old forest that now has already created a huge amount of energy and a huge amount of jobs. The way people do it is by tapping. So there is this flower stem 
You have to beat it up and shake it. There are more than 60 different tricks you have to master. It's local know-how. I brought it together from many tribes. And then the juice drips into that jerry can and you collect it. And uh, let's see. I don't think I can make this movie run, but basically what you do is you slice off a millimeter a day and then it starts dripping in copious amounts the juice. Now this one might... Can you maybe try something with a the cursor there and see if there's... Yeah, and then pull it... Yes, that's it. So here you can see the juice dripping from that stem in this jerry can. This is a seven-year-old sugar palm. And just to show you, this is a 30-liter jerry can and it has about 23 liters of juice with 14% sugar in it. But this is only one of two flowers that are being tapped simultaneously. So this tree produces 60 liters of juice. It has now already produced more than one ton of sugar and is still going strong. So people said it's impossible because you can only harvest with the energy that's inside the stem that's converted to sugar. But the stem only weighs 200 kilos and I have actually measured a thousand kilos of sugar. So it turns out scientists don't know everything yet. So one tree, on average, provides enough fuel to run one car year round. Now that makes things a little bit more realistic again. But you also have the wood. The wood is very strong, five times stronger than oak, very decorative, so you can use it for flooring and even the wood that was 50 years in the soil was still usable for construction. And this was an excavation of a boat, 1,300 years in the mud, and the palm fibers were still intact. So the palm, when you tap it, actually produces more and stronger timber that again produces jobs and additional income at the end of your cycle. And you can also harvest the fruits. These fruits here, are an incredible good delicacy in Indonesia, very expensive, but the fibers there as well. We're now working with Boulder uh, Fiber Institute to make biodegradable cars out of these fibers. They're very as strong as stainless steel. So you have all these products that create security. You have the fruits, you have the starch, you have the palm heart, you have the carbohydrate juice, the honey, all of them food products, even the larvae that you can mix that grow inside the stem with tree leaves that become cattle feed, from leaves that would otherwise not be able to use. So you can do a lot of good things. And then all these carbon benefits. In this system, you actually remove carbon from the atmosphere, store it in the soil while generating products. Not a bad deal. So we did it. We set up a foundation, through the foundation a cooperative, and I started this factory in Tomahawk. It's using waste geothermal energy, and it produces this sugar that we export to many countries in the world. And this factory, I actually miniaturized into a, a village hub, a mini factory that fits in three containers that can be brought to remote villages. So we first got all the people together and they agreed, okay, you give us the jerrycans, you give us the knives and you buy our juice. So they get the jerrycans and they go up the trees and uh, slice off a millimeter of that stem every day and bring the juice in ox carts to the roadside where it's being picked up by our tank cars. Very simple. It's the coordinator of the people themselves that does the supervision of the whole process and he has to be democratically elected. So very simple. The, the guy, the farmer, gives his cart, goes onto the scanner. So, okay, the file opens, we write down the number of the jerry can, we measure with a stick how many liters of juice there is, and we measure the pH and the quality. Yes, it will work. And we measure the sugar concentration, and guess what? They get paid, but the woman didn't agree because they noticed that her husbands weren't that often home anymore. So they then started recording exactly what we were recording, and reported it to each other. So the woman came with thousands, because there are 8,000 in the uh, microcredit schemes there, and they demanded that the money is going to be paid in bank accounts on Saturday before going to the church on Sunday. And guess what? The women won, so the men are not too happy, but 
in overall, it's not going too bad with that society because they have now a threefold income. They got insurance and they got permanent jobs. So how do you make it work? The social part is as important as the technical part because people have to trust each other. So they have a gender shareholders meeting where they decide what to do with the profit of the factory. We have these democratically elected leaders per village where we provide them. We have those tanks that then go pick up the juice and we work together with the Rabobank to set up the training courses for the cooperative uh, managers and uh, we set up micro credit schemes and then fellowship programs and all these farmers then were trained how to do the right technique. They got all these membership cards and if you want to see, this is how many families are now living from one factory while saving 200,000 trees a year. So we do have the possibility to come up with sustainable solutions. But in our case, we have a geothermal plant and the waste steam we get for free. And that is what is saving all the uh, trees in our uh, forest there. So now wildlife is coming back. So this is the area with orange on this map shows where you can grow sugar palms worldwide. We have the right altitude, temperature, rainfall, soil types, and where you do not destroy virgin rainforest. And if we look at places where we can produce ethanol cheaper than Brazil can do it, that's this land. That's 1.6 billion hectares, assuming an income of $5 per day for the farmers doing the tapping. But with 540 million hectares, we can already replace all the world's oil. So, maybe it might be good to create a million jobs, and that's what I hope, because we have loads of this land where we can implement that technologies. I'm not going to do this one. The village hub, this is um, one of my patterns. How to roll it out is actually a mini factory where you put in the juice, some yeast and some training. You connect it with a satellite dish and you get local products out of it. Yeah, I'm almost, it's not yet five, you know, I'm going to finish it. <laughs> wow, you should see her eyes, guys. <laughs> So what you get out of that juice locally is ethanol. You can use it for transportation, for cooking, for fuel, and for electricity, and you have drinking water out of it while getting a very large amount of sugar in a stable form of syrup that you can transport. And this is how it looks like. So we have a zero waste system where you integrate the process of, of nature. So what goes in is juice and sunlight and out comes ethanol, meat and clean water while having no emissions, having no need of fertilizer or pesticides, simply by imitating nature. Producers, plants, consumers and decomposers, combined with a little bit of technology like distiller. This is one of the parts that works. The great thing about sugar is if you have sugar, you have the future of the world because from sugar you can make ethanol, you can also do platinum-based catalytic conversion to hydrogen. You can also make lipids. You, you don't need oil palms. You can make any of those food products. You can also program algae to make alkanes for jet fuel from sugar. The basic thing is, where do you get your cheap sugar stock? And that's from a mixed forest, which provides lots of jobs for local people. So besides those biofuels, you can also make biodegradable plastics and all kinds of other materials. So my conclusion is that if we have fair systems, we can create solutions. And they do need, indeed, to have all these three components of people, planet and profit. But they're not simple. So when I went to Kleiner Perkins and I explained this, and even Al Gore, my friend, he said, it's wonderful, but it's too complicated to tell our clients. They won't be able to grasp this, because this is also a simplified version of it. So, uh, we'll come later. So I think that we have lots to do for all the primates of the world, and that there are still possibilities, but we need to have a longer-term view. Thank you.